Recently, in looking at some of the more advanced Imperial TIE series starfighters, such as the TIE Defender, Phantom, and Hunter, a very relevant question has been raised. Why didn't the Galactic Empire produce more of these advanced TIE models and replace its inferior standard TIE fighter? It's certainly a fair question, as although there would be an increased cost for the more advanced models of roughly three to four times that of the standard TIE, the Empire would have been outfitted with far superior starfighters that were equipped with hyperdrive systems, cloaking devices, and torpedoes. For an Empire that seemingly spared no expense on weapons of war, evident by the construction of two Death Stars, one has to question why they didn't bear the added cost for these more advanced starfighters. In this video expose, I will explain the Imperial Naval Doctrine that was in place that resulted in the Empire relying on the simple standard TIE Fighter to fill the ranks of their Starfighter Corps, and describe why the standard TIE was not replaced completely with more advanced TIE models, such as the Interceptor, Defender, and Phantom. In order to understand why the Empire relied on the standard TIE Fighter model, it's necessary to first understand the Imperial Doctrine that emerged based upon the military experiences culminating with the Clone Wars, which pushed for the maximization of the role of Star Destroyers and the subordinated and complementary role of Starfighters. Following the Rusin Reformations at the end of the New Sith Wars, roughly 1,000 years before the events of A New Hope, the construction of large battleships was halted as the Republic Navy was dismantled. The size of the Republic's military vehicles was capped at 600 meters, with those exceeding this limit having their hyperdrive systems and navigational computers severely restricted. Therefore, in the centuries leading up to the Clone Wars, large Republic capital ships were rare and had come to be viewed as unnecessary. However, the Clone Wars produced a fundamental innovation in how space warfare was conducted. It ushered in a new age of enormous capital ships, with the Star Destroyer seeing rapid development and use in the war. Far exceeding 1,000 meters in length, the Republic Star Destroyers rose to become the bedrock of their fleet, as they carried enough firepower to bring destruction to entire star systems. The lessons learned from the Clone Wars had a fundamental effect on Imperial naval doctrine. Having seen firsthand the impact that the spread of the enormous Star Destroyer, Battlecruiser, and Star Dreadnought capital ships had during the war, the Imperial Navy developed a doctrine that emphasized the maximization of capital ship firepower. Through this primary doctrine of relying on large capital ships, the Imperial Navy did not emphasize achieving superiority on the starfighter level, and therefore subordinated the role of starfighters. The focus on capital ship firepower cemented the role of the Star Destroyer as the central warship within the Imperial Navy, and was the backbone of the Imperial fleet. Because the Imperial Navy was centered around the role of the Star Destroyer, the Empire's Starfighter Corps was subordinate to and completely dependent upon the Navy. This doctrine had profound and real effects on the designs of the Imperial Fleet. As the Clone Wars era Venator-class Star Destroyer reduced their Starfighter carrying capacity to make room for larger reactors, heavier armor, stronger shields, and greater weapons, Starfighters became less important and their role was gradually reduced. As these impressive upgrades were made on the Star Destroyer level, and the role of the Starfighter was reduced, the Doctrine required only a bare-bones fighter, a role that was perfectly filled by the standard TIE Fighter model. TIE Fighters only needed to serve as a complement to the central role of the Star Destroyer, and the standard TIEs of the Empire did exactly that serving as escorts, scouts, hidden fade raiders, and group support within the greater overall mission of the Star Destroyer. Within this minor simple role called for by the new Imperial Doctrine, TIE Fighters did not require hyperdrive systems, deflector shields, life support systems, cloaking devices, or even heavy weaponry like proton torpedoes, as was seen within the more advanced TIE series models. This was thought to be completely unnecessary in their support role and subordination to the Star Destroyer. The Imperial Navy's strategy and most important functions included setting up blockades around a rebellious planet to whittle down their ability to fight slowly, annihilating a planet's infrastructure through bombardment, and transporting large amounts of military material and support to locations around the galaxy. 
None of these could be carried out or even significantly impacted by the Empire's starfighters, and had to be performed by its star destroyers. Therefore, the role of the TIE fighter was only meant to support these actions, and any addition to the offensive or defensive capabilities of the standard TIE model was seen as grossly redundant and an unnecessary cost that would take away from the Empire's ability to carry out these primary functions. When viewed in these terms of overall Imperial naval doctrine, one can quickly see how completely replacing the Empire's TIE fighters with, for example, the much more impressive TIE Defender model would actually be a detriment to the support role demanded by the Empire's Starfighter Corps. Given that cost would demand that the standard Imperial class Star Destroyer would have to decrease its Starfighter capacity from 72 TIE Fighters to 31 TIE Defenders, since Defenders are 2.3 times more expensive than the standard TIE, although you now had a Starfighter that had a hyperdrive, deflector shields, proton torpedoes, and even a tractor beam, the reduction in sheer numbers would be a detriment to the overall strategy of the Empire, as there would be less vehicles to serve as escorts and scouts, and to provide support to potentially numerous hotspots. Decreasing numbers in this manner, when a bare-bones TIE fighter would be sufficient, would also violate the Empire's Tarkin Doctrine, and the concept of ruling through the fear of force, rather than through force itself, as a decrease in TIE fighters, which by themselves would cause fear within a civilian population, would limit the ability of the Empire to project its presence and force throughout the galaxy. Therefore, only when the Empire required more advanced starfighters to deal with the powerful starfighters and tactics of the Rebel Alliance did the Empire need to move away from its standard TIE fighter model, as it by itself was sufficient to carry out its support and subordinate role within the larger Imperial naval doctrine centered on the Star Destroyer. So there we have it how Imperial Naval Doctrine required only bare-bones standard TIE Fighters, and why the Empire didn't completely replace them with more advanced models. We love making these videos, so why not subscribe for more fun Star Wars theories and discussions? Also, if you enjoyed the video, think about giving a like or leaving a comment. If not for me... For Simitar Assault Bomber.